Good morning and welcome today. Today it's a special seminar day because we have, you know, three speakers. So what we will do is that we will give around like 12 or 15 minutes to each of them. They will speak one after the other and then at the end we'll have 15 minutes for your questions. So save them for the end. Um, our first speaker will be Noor Haliza Hassan. I've trained how to say names correctly at the beginning. <laughs> Um, so she's from the Institute for Tropical Biology and Conservation in the University of Malaysia, Sabah. Um, she has her PhD from Australia and she works today as a lecturer in her university. So she will talk a little um, about bats, fragmentation, right, and geographical barriers shaping bat population genetics for us. Yep. Thank you and welcome. All right. <laughs> So thank you, Via, for the introduction. So hi, everyone. My name is Noor Haliza. Um, you can call me Lisa. Just, yeah, it's a, it's a long name. So today I'm just going to share with you my study interest, which, which is basically bats um, in Sabah, Malaysia, Borneo. So it's just an overview. So it's just a sharing. So I hope, um, yeah, I hope I won't bore you. <laughs> right. So if you, um, I think most of you are aware of Borneo is a hot spot biodiversity, right? Um, yeah, biodiversity hotspot. Sorry. So there is, um, we have a, a high number of bat species. Not only bat species, but I'm talking about bats. So I'm <laughs> just going to focus on the bat species in Borneo. We have a lot. They look pretty much similar. But if you're trained in identifying bats, I think you might be able to tell what what genus they are. Yeah. So, um, but then again. Even though we, we know that we have around like 100 plus species in Borneo itself, but there are still increasing number of new species um, discovery um, these days. Uh, for example, these are some of the most recent species discovery from a few genus that are available in Borneo. And um, one thing which is similar is because of uh, cryptic morphology in this partic uh, particular uh, organism or, or the bats. And uh, knowing Borneo itself, we in the rainforest in Borneo is having like, you know, there's a lot of habitat modification and we are facing habitat fragmentation and loss at a very high speed rate. So it is very crucial for us to have like a very good list of inventory, what kind of um, species that we have or we might not be able to record, we might lose some species without we are aware of it. So one of the things that I'm doing back in Sabah is trying to have a, you know, a good list of what we have um, in various places. But there are issues in bat species identification. So some, one, of, one of the most um, glaring ones are what we call the cryptic unrecognized species in high, in high abundance and widespread species. So meaning to say, um, in species which is, we know they are in high abundance, we know it, ha it occurs widespread, meaning we have, we found it everywhere in Borneo or we found them in Peninsular Malaysia even, right? But um, in the end, when we look closely, they are bas basically different species. We identify them as one, but in the end, when we look closely, they are different species. So these are four of the examples I would like to share to you today. So this particular species is what we call Synoptros bacriotis. You can, um, if you look at it, it have a dog-like face. It looks like a dog, right? So basically any bat that looks like this are fruit eaters. They, they eat fruits, right? If they have a longer muzzle, they eat um, pot, um, nectars, they're nectar, nectarivores, right? For this particular species, um, where, when, wherever you go for sampling, you would definitely find it, especially if you go near the orchids where there is a lot of fruiting trees. Um, so what happened was, because the, it is like a very widespread species, nobody really looks at it, but for, um, there are some researchers who actually, okay, there's so much of this species, and they, um, we identify bats based on the forearm length, and um, when they look at the records, this particular species shows a very wide range of forearm length. So they decided, okay, we need to look at their um, genetic and apparently there are two morphotypes of this um, species, the large size and the small size. So it has been identified and it has been split 
based on the genetic because um, the cytochrome B is what we normally use, use for the bats. Um, they found a divergence of 8.7% for one and the other found around 8.3%. So these are two separate um, researchers. So they found pretty much the same thing. So basically, um, when we, they look at it genetically, they look at it morphologically, basically one is larger than the other. So they decided the smaller one um, is called the minutus, synaptrus minutus, and the other is denominated synaptrus papiotis. So they look pretty much similar. It's just that the forearm length is very different. But of course, um, the smaller one is normally found in the forest interior, but the other, um, the bigger ones, you can find it outside um, in more open area. In terms of Athelop selecto and Athelop sequalis, so in Borneo, we only have one, gene, one species for Athelops, which is Athelop selecto, um, and the only one in the Southeast Asia. But when they do some genetic studies, because this particular species is a highland species, so it's like, you know, you can only find it more than a thousand feet above sea level. So when they do the, uh, the genetic study, they actually found that, oh, the Borneo, the one, the species, this Atlops electo in Borneo is actually very different um, genetically from the one in Peninsular Malaysia. So they decided to elevate the subspecies of the, these Atlops in Borneo to, Ath which is at Aqualis. So the one that we know from Borneo is now is Athelop aqualis, sorry, <laughs> Athelop aqualis, and Alecto is only found in Peninsular Malaysia. The same with this particular bat species, which is Baleonictris maculata. It can be easily identified because it got white spots all over its wings, right? And it is the only species in in both peninsula, previously peninsula, uh, Malaysia in general. So when they look closely at its um, genetic, it's genetically different. So the Baleonictris maculata is the species that we found in Borneo, but maculata previously known from peninsula Malaysia is actually now called um, Semundi. So it's, it's, yeah, because of the genetic difference. So they decided they're pretty much different because um, I maybe I failed to, <laughs> um, uh, highlight that Peninsula Malaysia and Borneo is pretty much separated by the South China Sea. And then finally, the Carivola papillosa. So this is an insectivorous bat, so it, it eats um, insects, generally. So this is one of the other species which is pretty common. Um, but then again, it's not common in abundance, but um, in any um, sampling trips that we go, we caught at least one individual of this species. Um, but because, like we mentioned before, it's widespread, when, but when we look at the genetic, it is actually have two forms, the large and the small forms. This has been also noted by another study uh, researcher, which is Faisal Anwar Ali. Um, but then, and we did the morphologically similar like Synoptrus bacriotis, it is morphologically different. And genet um, this is supported by its genetic um, data. But uh, for this particular um, species, we haven't got to the end of it. So it is still um, an ongoing in preparation for the species description. Right, so that's one. So the other um, issues that we found in species, um, bat species identification, is that we have a lot of overlapping key identification. Like I mentioned previously, the bats are um, identified based on the forearm length. But then because of that, um, there are very minimal um, difference between one species to another. This is especially in Hippocytus species, um, as you know, one of it is this one, <laughs> and the Carivola species. So um, recently, that's in 2018, they have actually found, um, we normally, identified them as bicolor, but when we look at its echolocation call, they echolocate at two different um, range. One is 142 kilohertz and one is 131 kilohertz. So in the end, they decided, okay, these are two different species. So now um, we have to be <laughs> very careful when, okay, this is a bicolor, but we need to check for its echolocation. So one is actually uh, the 141, uh, the 142, kilohertz, the echolocated 142 kilohertz is actually um, called Kunzi now, and the other one is still the bicolor. 
they look pretty much the same. As for Caribola heart wiki, um, we know that this particular species has a species complex. So recently, not that recent, 2018, um, a group from Vietnam actually uh, found, I mean, described um, new species from this uh, particular species complex. But then again, four species in one, but what about the three? So it is still an ongoing investigation, I believe. And finally, um, if previously we look at, okay, they look pretty much similar, but they're very different. But in other cases, there are variation, right? So these ones are what we call Hypocytorus cervinus. We know that they come in three forms, one in brown, one in orange, very orange, bright orange, and one in gray, right? But there is no differences in the morphology. And we, when we check their um, well, preliminary studies on the genetic, um, it says the value is less than 1%, so that is not much different. And they actually found an albino one from um, Bako in Sarawak. So that is a, a very rare finding. I haven't seen one, but this particular group actually recorded that. But then again, we were thinking, because it is too widespread, if wherever you go, you can find them in high abundance, because this particular species love rocks and caves. Um, yeah, but this particular species is uh, still a very much of interest for, for bad, bad um, researchers. And this is what we call the Rhinolophus trifoliatus. So this particular species can be easily identified by its nose leaf. It has a yellow or golden no nose leaf. As you can see on the photo, um, it has like golden or yellowish pelage, right? But it comes in gray form as well. So I'm not very sure if it is because of high elevation, but I found the one, because this gray form is found in a higher elevation that's pouring, so there's high elevation. And this is like lowland. I think this is from Gomantong Madai. But um, I have found gray ones, which are from low sec lowland secondary forests as well. So there are variation, but I'm not very sure what are the reasons for that, and we need to figure it out. And um, there has been talk that, okay, there's a new species that looks like Rhinolophus trifoliatus, but I don't think so, they look that similar. They call it Francisi. On, this is only found in Trusmadi, which is uh, a highland in Sabah. But it's similar in terms of the structure of its nose, nose leaf, not, not the coloration, because the others, among the Rhinolophus, this particular species has the most like very beautiful, complex nose leaf structure. And, and apparently uh, Francis C is the other one, but it, it's more brownish than yellowish, so we can easily um, figure them out. So this is not Francis C, this is another uh, species, but it looks pretty much similar, right? So these are some of the issues that we found um, in terms of bat identification. So if you're looking into bat, but just for morphology, just for morphology, I think you can't be too sure especially with those species who have those particular issues in them. Right. Um, so some of the ongoing work they're still working on um, is on Embalonera alecto. We thought there is uh, a subspecies within that particular species. There are differences between um, the one in North Borneo and Kalimantan, which is the, the southern part of the whole island Borneo. But because we have limited number of specimen and limited access to the type specimen, we can't really be too sure on this, but we are still working on it. The other species that are of interest um, is the Hypocytorus diadema. This particular species is one of the biggest, no, mm -hmm. it is the biggest um, insect eating bats. It's like this big and that big, <laughs> if you very open the wing. Um, and this particular species is very specific. It's a calf bat. You can only find them in cave and in high abundance, right? So we found like two different um, calf um, diadema, which is from the Balamangan Island. It's a small island up here in, in Borneo. And um, we compare them from the one in Gamantong, which is here around there, yep. And we found that very like different, they're very different. If you can see, they're spongy. But then we have limited uh, number, right? So we actually are in the process of adding that in um, and we're trying to figure it out. Is it the same or is it very much different? So from what we know, um, we can basically see that Arikana species is common in widespread species. 
Even though it's common, you need to think again, is it really, you know, is it there really one species? So because there are um, factors of geographical isolation and then there's, um, because Borneo has a really complex um, ecology, right? We, the, the, the animal tends to have like niche partitioning, even though it lives in the same ecosystem, but they are partitioning themselves according to the um, forest resources. And particularly if they have um, niche partitioning, they, they kind of lead to reproduction isolation towards the end of it. So these are some of the questions that, that I am very interested in answering. Um, if what species are the mountainous species are more affected by geographical isolation from the rest because of the geographical um, yeah, barrier, right? So what about the bad populations from the island? Are the ones from the small ones are very much affected um, as much as the bad populations from a larger island? So these are the, some of the questions I'm very interested to answer. And are the morphological variation, if there is any observe or permanent change, or is it just morphological plasticity, right? So my mission is on targeting some more widespread species um, in, in Borneo and those populations which are very isolated, right? If you want to see any genetic structure and probably using morphology, a part of morphology, genetics to incorporate the acoustic tools as well for our analysis. Um, so those are the team. <laughs> and yeah, thank you, that's it from me. She needs this. She needs this. This way? It's not moving. Change your computer to flow is on technical problem. Huh? Does it go here? Here? How to on? <laughs> no? Is it on? No, it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 All right. Welcome, Sarah, and thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Bia, for the introduction. So, hi, hi, hello, everybody. Um, so, uh, my name is Siti Sarayati. Um, I'm from the Faculty of Applied Sciences in University of Technology, Mara, uh, one of the university in Malaysia, in Sabah, Malaysia. Okay, um, so today I'm going to um, share with you um, one part of my PhD study on the uh, environmental effect. I mean, environmental enrichment effect on fecal glucocorticoid metabolite and um, behavior uh, and cap in captive sun bear behavior. Okay. All right. In the world, we have um, eight species of bear. So this is the, the smallest bear in the world. Okay. Um, it is known as honey bear, and uh, previously it also known as uh, the dog bear. Okay, because it's do bark like a bear. Like a dog, okay. It's barking like a dog, uh, so that is why it is also known as a dog bear. Um, so this uh, bear can be found um, in the uh, lowland forest, okay. In um, tropical forest, uh, they uh, also inhabit the dense lowland forest, lower montane swamp area, and mixed secondary forest and plantation area. Um, so this bear is very important because it play an important role, important ecological role in its ecosystem. Okay. This bear is an omnivore. Um, therefore, it acts as uh, the seed disperser 
and also an important um, member in its community. Um, one of the problem um, when we talk about the population of this bear, um, they are the population is declining, okay, um, by thirty percent, and currently they are categorized as vulnerable um, species. Um, and they are extinct locally in Singapore, where you, we, we cannot find any single individual of this bear in Singapore anymore. Uh, the main um, issues, I mean, or the main problem faced by this bear in the wild, they are poached for their, um, for their, um, how to, internal organ, okay. And um, in certain area in China, uh, they believe that the bile of this bear can cure some um, uh, disease. So they were hunted by that particular um, reasons. And in Malaysia and Indonesia, the main uh, problem faced by this bear is uh, fragmentation, okay, where um, they experience um, habitat loss because of fragmentation. And because of that, Many um, conservation efforts have been conducted in order to uh, conserve this particular bear. So one of them is by putting them in a captive environment. Um, in captive environment, they were given an adequate food. Um, they have uh, good treatment in terms of their, um, if they're sick, there's a treatment for them. Um, however, we know when we put um, wildlife in um, captive environment it is to which is totally different in their um, in their nature of course it will lead to many problems so um, one of the problem is um, where the bear will perform an abnormal behavior okay for example like stereotypic behavior uh, when we talk about stereotypic behavior in bear basically they will do like passing um, uh, back and forth, and then uh, they will um, uh, suckling their feet, um, and then they're begging for food from the visitors. Okay, and all this uh, behavior will lead them uh, to become stressed, um, especially when they're begging for food and none of the visitor give them food. Of course, they will feel stress. Stress, right? Um, and this uh, can harm their welfare in captivity and uh, therefore uh, the study um, there are one objective of this study uh, which is to measure the level of fecal glucocorticoid metabolite in captive sun bear via the cortisol hormone yeah the cortisol hormone is the stress hormone uh, regarding their stress level before and after enrichment programs Okay, uh, for this study, uh, the study have been conducted in um, five different area, uh, captive environment in Malaysia. Okay, so two of them, three of them actually, uh, three of them is in Borneo, and two from Peninsula Malaysia. So in the study, it involves seventy three individuals, captive individuals of sun bear. Uh, consists of adult male and adult female, a juvenile male and also a juvenile female. So um, I started the study uh, by doing the behavioral observation on the um, particularly on the abnormal behavior. Okay, so um, so I use an etogram to uh, observe the behavior. Uh, of kept, uh, active behavior, passive and also abnormal behavior. So this is um, some of the abnormal behavior um, in captive animals, not only sun bear, in captive animals. Um, so, um, so this is which is I'm focused on. All right, and then after um, I gained the result from the uh, behavioral observation, I continue with uh, introducing an environmental enrichment to the bear. 
uh, there are three types of environmental enrichment. Um, basically, uh, food enrichment, uh, sensory enrichment, where I put um, the cinnamon powder inside the gunny bag, and also occupational enrichment, where there is like a ball here. I hang the ball here. It's contained food inside the ball, so the bear need to dig out the food from the ball in order to get um, the food. So that is what we call an occupational enrichment. And then, um, yeah, after that, I collect the fecal sample, okay, um, in order to uh, measure their uh, cortisol hormone level. Okay, so this one, um, I did it before and after the enrichment. Okay, so I collect the fecal sample before the enrichment and after, um, during the enrichment and after enrichment, and, I, and then I measure uh, the difference between them. Okay, so looking on the result and discussion, uh, in terms of, uh, because I forgot to mention just now, in uh, the study area, there are one area um, which is considered a semi-captive environment where the bear will be released to the um, some, some kind of a forest, but it also uh, covered by something to make sure that the bear cannot escape from that particular forest. And then at night, they will be uh, putting back in the cage. Okay, so that one we consider as semi-captive. And captive, of course, uh, the one that we can see in the uh, zoo, for example. Okay, so from the study, I found uh, five types of abnormal behavior, head tossing, passing, uh, allo suckling, begging, and circling, where the bear um, keep on um, moving in a circle way. All right, and um, I found that um, compared to semi and semi captive and captive environment, um, passing seems to be higher in captive compared to uh, semi captive, because in semi captive the bear still can go around the forest. They can still playing with the uh, with other bear. They can still climbing the 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 the, the, called the trees, which is uh, the normal behavior. Uh, that they um, perform in the wild, uh, but not in captive because in captive it's very uh, restrict. The usually in captive the environment is not as rich as in the uh, semi-captive environment, so therefore um, they tend to do passing more compared to the one in semi-captive. So passing has the highest uh, percentage of observation, followed by head tossing. Um, and some allo suckling and begging. And surprisingly, circling only can be found in uh, semi-captive, but not in uh, captive. Um, this is because uh, um, in semi-captive, the area is quite large. So when they're stressed, they will go circle, in circle. But in captive, the environment is uh, the called the enclosure size it's quite uh, limited so they cannot when they stress they cannot circle go, do circle in that particular area therefore they will passing uh, go to the left and right back and forth and so on okay um, yeah so but they're passing a lot um, so when you go to the uh, to the zoo and you see animals go left and right, left and right, meaning the, the animals is not happy. Um, they are stressed, so they are actually doing passing. Um, yeah. Okay, so when we look on the, uh, the cortisol concentration just now, the stress hormone, we can see when we compare between uh, semi-captive and captive, um, you can see uh, captive has higher uh, concentration of cortisol compared to semi-captive. And between the four uh, study sites in captive exhibit, um, there's no significant difference between them. It's almost the same in terms of the uh, concentration. This is during pre-enrichment. 
Okay, so after enrichment, uh, we can see that uh, the number is reducing. I mean, the concentration, the cortisol concentration is reducing, meaning the, uh, we can say that the uh, enrichment helped to reduce the, uh, the stress in the bear itself. And I did measure the cortisol concentration again after the post enrichment, where I put out all the enrichment that being introduced. And um, it shows that the, uh, and the cortisol concentration increased again during the post enrichment, uh, during the post enrichment. So um, we can say that uh, they do stress. When we see this one, we, uh, when we uh, relate with the passing just now, uh, it really sh uh, show that the bear is actually stress in the uh, captive environment. And one of the way that we can reduce um, the uh, the stress is by introducing them with enrichment. And when we compare between uh, adult male, uh, male and female, adult male and uh, adult and juvenile, um, it also have the same pattern where. The concentration is reduced, uh, cortisol concentration reduced during the enrichment and higher in the pre-enrichment. Uh, same goes to this adult and juvenile. In the pre-enrichment, the concentration is high and it's reducing during enrichment and increase again after, uh, in the post-enrichment. Alright, um, so we can see here during, uh, between male and female, male have higher concentration of cortisol compared to female. Uh, this is um, actually uh, normal for a captive uh, animals. Yeah, male tend to be more stressed compared to female uh, because usually male um, in the nature they will forage more. Okay, they will look for the food more compared to female. Female usually will um, need to, um, of course, they need to look for the food, but at the time they have, like, uh, especially for um, female with offspring, they will spend most of their time um, grooming, um, do parental care to their young. And do, uh, between adult and juvenile, adult and juvenile, adult seems to feel stress more compared to juvenile compared to juvenile is because juvenile they play a lot they play a lot they can play with their mother they can play with uh, things surrounding them but not for uh, male male um, in the wild they are solitary so they uh, adult yeah adult adult they are solitary so they have many things to do in the wild but not in um, captivity so that is why here male have uh, what do you call a uh, male is more stress compared to female and adult uh, consider more stress compared to juvenile. All right, so this is the one that I mentioned just now. Uh, this is the uh, cortisol concentration um, in pre enrichment. This one is during enrichment, and this is. Uh, sorry, this is during enrichment and this is um, post enrichment. So, as a conclusion, um, this um, fecal glucocorticoid metabolite concentration was elevated in pre enrichment period, but it was re uh, reduced during the enrichment period. However, it returned uh, when FGM increased again um, during post enrichment period. So, overall, um, we can say that this study uh, indicated that sun bear do feel stress. They, they do experience stress in captive environment. I think everybody will feel stress if we are in the captive environment, right? So what else? Um, wild animals. Okay. So one of the way that we can help to reduce their stress is by introducing the environmental enrichment. And in this study, it uh, do... Um, uh, what you call um, indicate that this uh, enrichment help to reduce uh, the cortisol concentration, which is the um, stress hormone 
in bear, which are generally associated with distress in mammals. So I would like to acknowledge the EBD um, seminar organize, organ, organizer uh, to giving us an opportunity to share our study. And yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we'll have our last speaker of the day. That Master. will be Roslina Binti Ragai. Uh, she is today a wildlife officer in the Sarawak, Sarawak, do I say it correctly? Yeah. Yes, Forestry Corporation. And where she has been um, working in monitoring land vertebrate. So she will talk today about the monitoring of these vertebrates in the Lanjak Entimao Wildlife Sanctuary. Um, yeah, so we're ready. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, a very good morning, afternoon, na night with my friend in Malaysia. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, first of all, thank you, Bia. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Ah, I'm nervous. Okay, uh, so uh, um, uh, today I will be presenting about our works in one of our largest uh, totally protected area in Sarawak. So, um, next. so a little bit about myself. I'm uh, working with Sarawak Forestry Corporation since 2016 until present. So I uh, graduate in Bachelor's Con Conservation Biology and have a working experience since 2006 where I work with different companies in tree plantation and timber companies doing conservation like wildlife monitoring uh, including mammals, birds and other yeah so my topic of since uh, during that period of time I also work with the communities so I am interested in integrating the knowledge of biological diversity with the livelihood of the local communities living adjacent to our uh, TPAs, which is totally protected areas. So this presentation uh, is just to give you an overview or review of uh, vertebrate diversity uh, from Lanja Antima Wildlife Sanctuary, where it's a, it based on uh, data that we collected since 2016 until 2020. And I will compare that with the previous data that was collected years ago, like about uh, 10 years or more than, than that. And will be uh, on amphibians, reptiles, freshwater fish, birds, and mammals. So others are uh, let in, yeah, so vertebrates. Okay. So let's see, I bring you all to Southeast Asia, uh, so you will know where is Malaysia. <laughs> so here you go. This is Malaysia, our small country, where we have our neighbors like Indonesia, Philippines, uh, Thailand, Cambodia. And we are sp uh, split into two, which is uh, Peninsula Malaysia and Borneo. So in Borneo, there is a consist of three countries, which is Malaysia, Brunei and uh, Indonesia. So two states in Malaysia is in Borneo and here we go, here is Sarawak. And my study area, which is Lanja Antima Wildlife Sanctuary, is here. A very small part but give a very uh, 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 in, uh, largest, our largest uh, uh, wildlife sanctuary. So uh, we have three station, research station in the area. It was gazetted as a wildlife sanctuary way back in 1983, and it uh, it consists of 182,983 hectares. So, where is the pointer? So, as you can see, it's neighbor with our another uh, national park, which is Batang Ayat National Park, and then you can see here is also uh, we are bordering with Kalimantan, Indonesia, and if you're familiar with this. Actually, this is also a national park, which is Betung Kerihun National Park. So if this one, uh, this area is considered in the heart of Borneo project under WALF, WWF. So if you search for heart of Borneo, there's an initiative also uh, for this area, which is the heart of Borneo. It's like consists of all the countries that, uh, that in this island. Okay, so we have three stations and and 
my focus, most of my studies is in this area, but at the same time, we're also trying to collect all the information from uh, areas that we can access. For your information, this area is very difficult to access, and I will show you why. Okay, okay. so this is one of the mode of uh, transportation, river. Okay, so uh, the river system is quite dangerous because the rapids is very uh, um, strong and I have friends that they, they bought, uh, uh, what is that? <laughs> yeah, they both get uh, uh, into, uh, uh, yeah, they, 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 yeah, sink, yeah. So, yeah, and then in the core zone area, we have, uh, it's not uh, very, it's hilly, but the highest uh, elevation is only about 1,200 meters above sea level. But I myself, I haven't go to this area, which I think is must be very interesting because it's in the core area of the sanctuary, which is called Bukit Sekanjan. And this is how we, we go to this place. Most of the time it's using boats and sometimes we have to Instead of boat carry us, we carry boat and yeah, things like that happen when water level is very low, we have to, you know. So it's very, very, um, need a lot of manpower, especially the local people that know the area. So yeah, it's a lot of work. Okay, now you know the place, you know where we are. Let's see, past studies was done by, uh, because uh, it's a, like, uh, the gazettement of the area is a totally protected area. So in 1982, uh, there's a management plan was written and very the data is not as intensive. So in 1993 to 2004, uh, International Tropical Timber Organization project was um, set up with the, our uh, forest, uh, forest department, Sarawak Forest Department. So they have a three phases. And that was the development of Lanja Antima Wallace Century as a totally protected area. So during that time, there's more comprehensive studies and more uh, data collected and they explore more areas inside the sanctuary. So we have uh, information on mammals, birds, amphibians, reptiles, freshwater fish, plants and even soils. And in phase three, they do some more freshwater fish because the community living in that area depend so much with fish. Okay, so they also have some kind of community forestry. Okay, so present, where is the data was collected again in 2016 and to, uh, 2020 because of COVID, things didn't going so well and we kind of like uh, stop a little, but, but uh, we are keep going, uh, doing it now. So first one in uh, Nanga Segera, we've been collaborating with other agencies our collaborator from Smithsonian Institution was working with us on mammals and birds. And then Wildlife Conservation Society is focusing on orangutan, but they already did it along like a long term monitoring on orangutan in that area. So it's been like, uh, I think more, more than five years. So they have a very uh, intensive uh, monitoring of orangutan of the area, including uh, batang ai. So they call it bale, batang ai uh, lanja antimau. So it's, it's cover all this area. So they will be um, doing the population census from one area to one area. You can imagine how many months they trying to cover because this area actually uh, very critical for orangutan. Okay. And then we work together with Long Kang Lee Kong Chan Natural History Museum from Singapore on freshwater fish. And then we have birds, uh, Louisiana State University and Hornbill Research Foundation from Thailand. But uh, for Hornbill Research Foundation, we are focusing on uh, uh, Sarawak Hornbill Conservation Project, which is my friend Tina is lead that project. And uh, they are, I think now they are going to, towards the end of the project and maybe will be, uh, they are in like analyzing data and will produce report and uh, papers on that. And we also work with Lee Kong Chia Natural History Museum, again, freshwater fish. And last but not least is the other uh, research station Birds, uh, amphibian, reptile, freshwater fish was done by Lee Kong Chang as well. And so our colleague in uh, 2019 was doing a, a expedition in that area uh, for, for other... Uh, okay. So, that's it. Okay, let's go to see the differences between previous and 
uh, until the current one. So bear in mind that some of the studies it was done in different areas before and, 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 and recent. So although there is a gap 19 years, but we still uh, find new uh, records, although there's no, no new species for amphibian and reptiles, but there's new records uh, that we record from this area. Okay, and some species re-recorded, so means that uh, there's, mm, uh, we need to really, if we want to really to look at the difference between back then and now, I think uh, it's need, really need to look uh, uh, in terms of sites and, and more, 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 more work need to be done. <laughs> Easy to say, more work need to be done. Okay, so that's for amphibians. As you can see, total now is uh, for reptiles about 50 species, amphibians 64 species. I believe there's more. And then freshwater fish. This is interesting because there is two species of uh, freshwater fish that is famous with the local. We call it uh, royal delicacies. Because uh, you know why? Because Thor, uh, I can't remember, that, uh, um, we call it Empurau. Because that fish, uh, per kilo, it costs about maybe, I can't remember, but thousands ringgit or more, like per, per, kil per kilo. So it's a very expensive fish, and even I haven't tasted it yet, but it's very famous among the um, people in Sarawak because of the taste. And according to them, that fish, if you eat, you, didn't, you cannot. Uh, throw anything away. You can even eat everything from that fish. So it's, yeah, special. So, uh, but from Ulu, uh, from this area, we only uh, still have that species only from two one river system, which is the Ulu Katibas, the Nangablo. So the rest, they're no more, uh, because uh, I forgot to tell you that the the southern part, the southern part just now. Actually, there is a, a, a dam was built, so it it uh, it uh, closed the water system from upper river and down river, so there are no more that species there. Tor, I can't remember. Need to, yeah. But that's that's the specialty of the uh, fish from the area. But what I want to say here is that between the thirteen years, um, there's still more that was uh, recorded. And some species, they are locally endemic to the river, river system. Okay, so I show you, for example, this. This is Hypergastromyzon eubranchus. I think this is the species that, um, uh, okay, okay, need to be fast. Okay, so that's the fish. <laughs> uh, okay, now birds. So we have 263 birds recorded in the area. And we uh, described new species in 2019 when we do the survey with uh, Smithsonian Institution. It was uh, seen, observed in uh, Sabah, in Brunei, in Kalimantan, but they never can, they never caught it. They know that it's a new species. So in 2019, we are lucky enough to get the type specimen from uh, Nanga Segera, one of the station. And we describe and produce a paper on this, and you can, yeah, I think this is kind of like a big thing for the ornithologists way back in 2019. And we also have a Chrysler's fireback was recorded from the area as well. And uh, sad to say, when we find new species, we are maybe losing another species because this is a straw headed bulbul, which is heavily traded because of the. Um, Song, song. This is a songbird. Uh, here in Borneo, there's a lot of uh, 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 demand for the songbird. So this one, uh, some area is already we couldn't find it anymore, and some area, yes. But I think uh, in in the area, we're not sure if they are there or not. Need to do more surveys. Okay. And then mammals. This is my favorite, but it's around right, out of time. Okay. So, from mammals, we have 89 uh, species. So, the iconic one, of course, where we have the large one, orang utang, clouded leopard, bay cat, and Jose Sivert. This is some of the interesting uh, larger, not so large, but large. Uh, and I've been involved in uh, monitoring of wild uh, mammals in this area since 2016 with the Smithsonian. So, we've been doing uh, a camera trapping, and we add a few more uh, records. <laughs> No new species, but new record in the area. 
uh, for example, the, uh, this is not new record, but I just want to show you that we have, uh, this is our largest predator in, in the island. So in Borneo, it, we don't have tiger, panthera, or uh, leopard. So we have our uh, uh, clouded leopard. Uh, here you have Iberian lynx, we have uh, Bornean clouded leopard. So, <laughs> so yeah, you can, did you see the, 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 uh, so there you go. And then in 2019, one year later, we have another cub. So what, I, what is this show to us, even though we didn't have, uh, do a population census, but we just do camera trapping, we can see there is a, a, a reproduction happen in the forest, although we don't not sure yet, is it, uh, is it viable population or not? So yeah. Okay, next, this is some of the new uh, record through our camera trap surveys. And it just, uh, but it's very important, so I hate to show. Uh, just, no? No, okay, never mind. That's a video of, uh, it's a video of a mal, uh, ja, uh, Javanis Javanica, uh, Manis Javanica, our uh, most traded uh, pangolin in, in, yeah, in Southeast Asia. Okay, so, so as a summary, we have now data on amphibians, 64 species, reptile, 50, freshwater fish, 112, birds, 263, mammals, 89 species. So with this information, we, there is an importance to protect this whole area because of the local endemism. And so it is actually the largest TPA or totally protected areas that uh, uh, harbors a viable population for iconic species such as orangutans. And for your information, we record a lot of uh, sun bears uh, uh, detection in our camera trap as well. And so way forward, long-term randomized study plots, identify populations, estimate, for example, folklore leopard, social survey and engagement of local communities. And now I'm working on this with my our collaborators from uh, Community Conservation Inc. and Smithsonian. So this is what recent we did in, in early this year. So we, we engage with the local communities, we do um, workshop with them, trying to see what is their uh, vision for their future uh, generation. And we also actually trying to find out what is the young one think of and the, the ladies and the men. And they, they listen to me talking. And uh, we also want them to know how to use the, uh, technology such as uh, my GPS and, and camera trap for uh, surveys. So this is still in progress. And acknowledgement to our Ministry of Mudan, Ministry of Natural Resource and Urban Development Sarawak, uh, my employer, Sarawak Forestry Corporation, Smithsonian, Louisiana, Lee Kong Chiang, Hornbill Research Foundation, Wildlife Conservation Society, Community Conservation Inc. and local communities, the most important because they are really support our, our, our work in that area. And thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ross. <laughs> I'm doing uh, okay, so now I have some minutes for questions for the three of them, whoever wants. Not not time for many questions, though. So. <laughs> Rose, don't run away, it's for you. <laughs> so, uh, Rose, you said the area was about almost 200,000 hectares of the national park or the protected area. Does that include the part in Indonesia or it's, or it's only the part in Malaysia? No, that is only Lanja Antimawa last century. So that is why I said that is our largest. And that All that together, you have an idea how much can that be? I need to Google it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, because, because it's gigantic. It's yeah, very, very large. Because Betong Kerihun, I think Betong Kerihun in total area, because it's both, this is Indonesia, not Sarawak, not, not Malaysia. Betong Kerihun National Park and Danau Sentarum, they are connected. Danau Sentarum is like a river as a reservoir, like the, a big lake. And these two area already larger than our, that Lanja Antima. And, uh, uh, adding Lanja Antimau and Batang Batang Ae 
smaller that that two add together so that's why if you want to know more you can search for heart of Borneo project which is uh, you can see of the connectivity of this area and I think it's connect up to the Sabah which is uh, including even Brunei uh, with the Temburong uh, National Park and connecting up to the Mount Kinabalu so it's like a, a heart of Borneo <laughs> <laughs> and do you have an estimate of the population of orangutans for example Or not? Uh, yeah, I know there is uh, information on that, but I don't have it here now. Okay, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, welcome. Thank you for your talk. Very nice and very interesting. Oh, uh, uh, my question is for the bat. Ah, uh, yeah. I wonder if um, uh, if you know how fragmentation of the area is uh, influence of the diversification of the different morphos in bats. Do you have any result? For, insta for instance, if you have the large morpho in fragmented areas or other situation? Yeah, if you have result of, uh, you are, are you measuring uh, how it's affecting the fragmentation in the morpho uh, abundance? I don't know. Um, uh. Currently, we don't, I don't have such information because what I haven't had, I've been trying to, le to study the species that which are in the pilot, right? Um, yeah. Oh, I need to. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, I think we could be able to see if we do the experiment in on, on an island, like a smaller island, but not on the bigger ones, because I have um, tried to look at morphological variation for highland species between different mountain tops, mm -hmm. but I can't find much different. They they would be like a very minimal different, which I thought. Um, could be because of the food sources, meaning to say um, the jaw, how do you say, the strength of the jaw, it's something that, uh, related to the jaw. So I thought it, the food could influence um, how, how the population of that particular species are, but not much on the fragmentation bit. Um, in terms of other species, um, I know that one study that um, studied one particular species, it is a forest independent bat. Um, they are very much affected by the how big is the area, how, how much, if the area is fragmented, they would be very much affected by it. But n uh, genetically, they actually look at it genetically, but not morphologically. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really aware of that. Particularly something that um, I would look into the future. Does that answer your question? Okay, yeah. yeah thank, thank you. you. Uh, hello. Uh, uh, actually, I would like to ask Rose. Uh, I would like to know um, what kind of species of small mammals that have in uh, this area since 2016 until now. Small mammals, especially maybe shrews and rats. Um, most of it is common for the uh, uh, forest, uh, primary forest, such as uh, we have um, yeah, Maximis, uh, we have Sundamis, uh, Lepoldamis. Uh, the, actually, that's genus name, but there's a few other species in that genus. And, uh, but that was done 
uh, way, like we didn't done recent. We only captured some of the photos in our camera traps, but only squirrels. And most of the species that we, uh, we have in our uh, photos is the ground tufted squirrels uh, and some tree shrews like tupaya, tupaya and uh, yeah. So uh, since we didn't, I, uh, way back uh, when it was done by uh, Dr. Han Kwai Hin and Ng Kamat Lading, it, they didn't do uh, uh, for specifically for shrews. So we didn't have data on, I mean, didn't uh, re have a record on shrews from the area. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you for the presentation, you guys. You guys did very well. Uh, f my question is for the second one. Sorry for uh, having forget your name. For okay, thank you. You said that uh, the bears got stressed stressed because the visitors don't uh, throw food to them, right? Is this uh, information uh, just by observations, or you guys have like data on it? Um, okay, thank you for the question. Basically, I um, it's only through my observation because we didn't do a proper study on that. But based on the previous study, yes, they uh, they feel stressed because of the visitors, um, where the pre the visitors pretend to give the food, but at the end, they just they didn't give. So the bear start to passing and show an aggressive uh, behavior. Um, so yes, they do, uh, the visitor do affect their uh, aggressiveness, that which lead to the stress in that particular bear. Thank yes, thank you. Sarah, I have a question for you too, actually. All right. <laughs> um, I don't know if I lost this part, but the bears that you studied, were they born in captivity or they came from the forest? Yeah, they, um, some of them do born in the uh, captive, um, but most of them, they are actually from the wild. Uh, they, they're from the wild. Um, the, uh, the wildlife um, um, department uh, capture them from the villages, uh, where the villages keep them as a pet. Yes, ah. so that is, um, they cannot do that. So the enforcement, took the, uh, the bear and put them in the zoo. So they, they are not really, I mean, they were pets before. None of them came straight from a, a forest. Uh, no. No. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Oh, okay, we have competition. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, my question is also for the second speaker, Siti. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's okay. about the relationship between cortisol levels and the stereotypical behaviors. And I think that the, at the end you show a link between the number of uh, these behaviors and the levels of cortisol. But anyway, my question is, um, so do you think that they do that behavior once that they are quite stressed, no? So have you record cortisol levels before and during the stereotypical behaviors in the way that maybe they do that just to like reduce stress somehow? It's like, okay, I need to move and then I reduce cortisol levels. Uh, do you mean... Um so it's like a response when they are very stressed and I don't know, it's like when they are doing the stereotypical behaviors, they are like highly stressed or it's a way to reduce yeah they will um, um, when they're passing it shows that they are stressed so um, I what I did yes I take the the data before enrichment um, where they have more passing and less passing during the enrichment so from that I can compare mm -hmm. um, their cortisol level and it really show that passing is reducing and cortisol also reduce. I mean, inc um, yeah, reduce mm -hmm. during the enrichment. So therefore, we can say that um, their stress is reducing during the enrichment. 
Yeah. Thanks. Did I answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Thank you. I I also have a question for the bird study. So <laughs> not the bird the bird the, the, the second bird. one. Yeah, the bird. Yeah. So <laughs> sorry. So uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, there was an increase in the level of corticos uh, in the in the semi wild uh, uh, treatment. That's the case. I saw from the graph from the last picture uh -huh, that you show. show it seems to me, but probably I'm wrong eh, because I don't see very well from the from. But I see an increase in the level of. The uh, let me show you the, yeah. the slide again. You referring to the semi-captive? Yeah. It seems to me probably I'm wrong. This one? No. Or this one, one here? No, there was another one before, probably. Had this is on the semi captive and captive. This no, is the before the bef or I uh, don't remember which one was what. This one? Yes, ER. There was the first one is f 54. Oh, yeah, I did not conduct any enrichment for semi captive. Yeah, but then in the same, it becomes 108 and 100. 108, which one? Oh, this one for Matang. Um, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. And then 140. This one? Yeah. And okay, then this is for Matang Wildlife. This is here. This is the number for before, um, before enrichment, and this is during enrichment. Ah, okay. So sorry. Yes, I didn't see well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. you okay. Know. So about that, when you, you talked about three different kinds of enrichment, uh, yep. and so here in like this table we were just looking at, did each bear oh, get yeah. one kind of enrichment or different kinds of enrichment, or how did how did that work? What does enrichment mean for an individual bear? Um, actually, I give them all the enrichment ah. altern alternately. 10 days for food enrichment, after 10 days I replace with sensory enrichment, then after that uh, I, I replace again uh, with acu occupational enrichment. So did you sample, you sampled in the three different kinds of enrichment? Yep. And were they all the same or did you have different results? Oh yeah, results I forgot the because this, um, I'm not focusing on the enrichment, that is why I did not uh, show the data. But then yes, between these three enrichment, food enrichment seems to be the most pref preferred by the bear. Mm. Yeah. Okay. But then it's good to, al to give <coughs> them, um, change the enrichment in order to, re to uh, prevent habituation. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, okay. yeah, a, few, a quick one. So, so I increased cortisol, cortisol levels sometimes affect body condition, and may even affect long-term like lifespan, like reduce longevity. Do you have any idea if if the the bears that are more stressed and have higher cortisol levels have a, a worse body condition and also reduce lifespan? All right, based on the literature, yeah, not based on my study. Yes, some of. Um, um, but not for sun bear. Okay. Other bears, yeah, they, uh, there's a situation where the bear, when they become very stressed, they become very aggressive and they can even um, hurt themselves. So, yeah, they can reduce their body uh, lifespan. Okay. Quick one? Okay. Uh, and I have a, a quick one for, for Rosalind. Uh, uh, Ros um, so, it's, it's great to see somewhere in the world where you tend to find more amphibian species that you used like 13 years ago. Um, so I'm curious, do you see any problem with chytrid fungus or are, are you taking any, any measures like, like cleaning, bleaching, uh, 
field boots and stuff like that to prevent chytrid fungus uh, expansion? So sorry for for so so fun some fungus that attacks amphibians specifically oh. like chytrids, mm -hmm. and they can be transported around. So you you don't have any problems with with fungus in those populations. Uh, I am aware that there is a research on that, but in this area, I uh, we don't have that kind of study done yet. Okay. Yeah. Well, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. It's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I'm trying to answer a question from uh, uh, Carles just now. So there is a population estimates by uh, WCS where uh, but there is a paper uh, uh, published by Joshua and, her, and his team. And based on that result, uh, it's about, uh, they estimate about 355 orangutans, uh, which is uh, 95 percent highest density interv interval of 135 to 602 individuals so yeah so that is estimations after a, f a few years of surveys and they published that in 2018 and it's about how many years ago so yeah they are doing so now they are starting their new uh, 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 long-term monitoring in that area I think after COVID it's starting back uh, end of this year or uh, next year in uh, January yeah that's all thank you Yeah. Okay. Oh, so we might have reached a point where we have to go to lunch. <laughs> and <laughs> I thank you very much for your attention. And I thank you three very much for presenting your. Yeah. Oh, we do have. With, with regard to lunch, we're going to meet in front and go out to lunch with the speakers. If anybody would like to join us, just come go to this article. Great. Thank you. And thank you. And well, that's it. Now you're all free. Free to go. <laughs>